The following document was anonymously shared with Keely Nett and is taken as a transcript of an introductory lecture given by David Hudson at the Northwest Service Center in Portland, Oregon on July 28, 1995. It offers additional insights into the researches of David Hudson, particularly in light of biological and space-time effects. My name is David Hudson. I'm a third-generation native Phoenician from an old family in the Phoenix area. We are an old family. We are very conservative. I come from an ultra-conservative right-wing background. For those of you who have heard of the John Birch Society, Barry Goldwater, these ultra-right-wing Rush Limbaugh conservatives, that's the area that I come from. I'm not saying whether it is right or wrong, but that is my background. Ad Namid sense 160 by 600 blue. I had no concept that I would ever be doing what I'm doing right now when I began this work. In 197576, I was very unhappy with the banking system here in the United States. I was farming about 70,000 acres in the Phoenix area in the Yuma Valley. I was a very large, materialistic person, IWASB farming this amount of ground. I had a 40-man payroll every week. I had a 4 million line of credit with the bank. I was driving Mercedes-Benz. I had a 15,000 square foot home. I was Mr. Material Man. In 1975 I was doing an analysis of natural products here in the area where I was farming. You have to understand that in agriculture in the state of Arizona we have a problem with sodium soil. This high sodium soil, which looks like chocolate ice cream on the ground, is just crunchy black. It crunches when you walk on it. Water will not penetrate this soil. Water will not leach the sodium out of the ground. It's called black alkali. What we were doing was going to the copper mines in the state of Arizona and buying 93% sulfuric acid. For those of you who don't know, the battery acid in your car is 4,060% acid. This was 93% sulfuric acid, very, very high concentration. We were bringing in truck and trailer loads of this sulfuric acid to my farm and I was injecting 30 tons to the acre into the soil. I had no concept that I would ever be doing what I'm doing right now when I began this work. In 197576 I was very unhappy with the banking system here in the United States. I was farming about 70,000 acres in the Phoenix area in the Yuma Valley. I was a very large, materialistic person. I was farming this amount of ground. I had a 40-man payroll every week. I had a 4 million line of credit with the bank. I was driving Mercedes-Benz. I had a 15,000 square foot home. I was Mr. Material Man. We were putting 6-inch ribbons on the ground that would penetrate about 3 or 4 inches into the ground. When you irrigate nothing will grow in Arizona unless you irrigate the ground would actually froth and foam due to the action of the sulfuric acid. What it did was convert the black alkali to white alkali, which was water-soluble. So within a year and a half to two years you would have a field that could actually grow crops. In the work that I was doing with these soils, it is very important that you have a lot of calcium in the soil in the form of calcium carbonate. The calcium carbonate would act as a buffer for all the acid that was being put on the soil. If you don't have enough calcium, the acidity of the soil goes down. You get a pH of 44.5 and it ties up all of your trace nutrients. When you plant your cotton it will only get so tall then it won't grow anymore. It's very important when you are putting all of these amendments on your soil that you understand what is in your soil, how much iron is there, how much calcium is there and so on. In doing the analysis of these natural products we were coming across materials that no one seemed to be able to tell us what they were. We began to trace this material and we found that it seemed to come from a specific geological feature. Whatever the problem with this material was we felt that the area where it was in greatest abundance would be the best place to study it. We took the material into chemistry and we dissolved it and got a solution that would be blood red, yet when we precipitated this material out chemically by using a reductant of powdered zinc the material would come out as a black precipitant just like it was supposed to be if it was a noble element. A noble element if you chemically bring it out of the acid it won't redissolve in the acid. So we precipitated this material out of the black and we took the material and dried it. In the drying process we took a large porcelain funnel called a butin a funnel about this big it had a filter paper on it. This material was about a quarter of an inch thick on top of the filter paper. At that time I didn't have a drying furnace or a drying oven so I just set it out in the Arizona sunshine which was about 115 degrees at 5% humidity so it really dried fast. What happened was that after the material dried it exploded. It exploded like no explosion I had ever seen in my life and I've worked with a lot of explosive materials. There was no explosion and there was no implosion. It was as if somebody had detonated about 50,000 flashbulbs all at one time just poof. All the material was gone. The filter paper was gone and the funnel was cracked. 
So I took a brand new pencil that had never been sharpened and stood it on end next to the funnel and started drying another sample. When the material detonated it burned the pencil about 30% in two but did not knock the pencil over and all the sample was gone. So this was not an explosion and was not an implosion, it was like a tremendous release of light. It was like you set that pencil beside a fireplace and after about 20 minutes you saw it was smoking on one side and burning in two. That's what the pencil looked like immediately after the flash. Now this just had me baffled. Whatever this stuff is it's wild. We found that if we dried it out of the sunlight it didnt explode but if we dried it in the sunlight it exploded. So then we took some of the powder that was dried out of the sunlight and we decided we were going to put it in what is called a crucible reduction. A crucible reduction involves taking a crucible which is like a big drinking glass made out of porcelain and you mix your powder with lead and all this flux and all and you heat it till the lead melts. What happens is the metals that are heavier than lead stay in the lead and all of those that are lighter float out. This is the basic premise of your fire assays which have been done for hundreds of years. Now supposedly gold and silver will stay in the lead and all your other non-heavy elements will come out of the lead. This is the tried and true way of doing metals analysis. Well this material settled to the bottom of the lead just like it was gold and silver. This material seemed to be denser than lead. When we poured off the slag it would take everything but the noble elements. Then we poured off the lead and this material came off as a constituency at the bottom of the molten lead. It was separated from it. Yet when you take this material and put it on a bone ash cupel the lead soaks into the cupel and it leaves your bead of gold and silver. Well we did this and we got a bead that should have been gold and silver. We took this bead for analysis to all the commercial laboratories and they said Dave there is nothing but gold and silver there, except I could take that bead and set it on a table and hit it with a hammer and it shattered like glass. Now there is no known alloy of gold and silver that is not soft gold and silver dissolve in each other perfectly and they form solid solutions and they are both very soft elements and so any alloy of gold and silver if that's all that there is going to be soft and ductile, you could flatten it out and make a pancake out of it, yet this material shattered like glass. I sighed something's going on here that we are not understanding, something unusual is happening. So what we did is we took these beads of gold and silver and separated them chemically with the gold and silver out, what we had left is a whole bunch of black stuff, when I took this black stuff to the commercial laboratories they told me that it was iron, silica and aluminum, I said this can't be iron, silica and aluminum, the first of all you can't dissolve it in any acids or any bases once it is totally dry, it doesn't dissolve in fuming sulfuric acid, it doesn't dissolve in sulfuric nitric acid, it doesn't dissolve in hydrochlorice nitric acid, even this dissolves dissolves gold yet it won't dissolve this black stuff. I thought this material is really strange, it just has to have an explanation, no one could tell me what it was. Basically I went to Cornell University, I said we are just going to have to throw some money at this problem, so I went and hired a PH. D. At Cornell Ho considered himself an expert on precious elements, I suspected we were dealing with precious elements, I said I want to know what this is, I paid him to come out to Arizona, he looked at the problem, he said we have a machine back at Cornell that can analyze down to parts per billion, he sighed you let me take this material back to Cornell and he'll tell you exactly what you have, exactly, unless it is chlorine, bromine or one of the lighter elements, then we can't analyze it, but if it is anything above iron we will find it, when he got back there he told me it was iron silica aluminum. I said look doctor do you have a chemistry laboratory around here we could borrow, he said yes, I said let's go to the chemistry laboratory, we worked in the chemistry laboratory all the rest of the day and we were able to remove all the silica, all the iron and all the aluminum, we still had 98% of the sample and it was pure nothing, I said look I can hold this in my hand, I can weigh it, I can perform chemistries with it, I said it is something, I know that is something, it is not nothing. He said the absorption or emission spectrum does not agree with anything we have programmed into our instrument. I said well that is something and I'm going to find out what. And he said Mr. Hudson why don't you give us a $350,000 dollar grant and well put graduate students to looking into it. Well he had already paid this man about $22,000 because he claimed he could analyze anything and he hadn't. He didnt offer to pay any of my money back. I said dear, I don't know what you pay the people around here but we pay minimum wage on the farm where I work and I can get a lot more out of $350,000 than you can, so I'm going to go back and do the work myself. I came back to Phoenix totally disillusioned with academia, I was not impressed with a PH. 
trustees, I was not impressed with the people I had paid money to, I found out that it is just a big system where they work the graduate students to generate paper but they never say anything but their government pays them for every paper they write so they get their money based on the number of papers they turned out, they all say the same thing they just reword it and turn out another paper, it really is disillusioning when you find out what academia is doing right now. Fortunately I asked around the Phoenix area and I found out about a man who is a spectroscopist, he had been trained in West Germany at the Institute for Spectroscopy, he had been the senior technician for lab test company in Los Angeles which builds spectroscopic equipment, HE is the man who blueprinted them, designed them, constructed them then took them to the field and then made them work, I said here's a good man, this is not just a technician, here is a man who knows how the machine works. I went to him with a Soviet book that the fire assay man had given me, it waskled the analytical chemistry of the platinum group elements by Ginsberg. It was published by the Soviet Academy of Sciences, in this book, according to the Soviets, you had to do a 300 second burn on these elements to read them. Now for those of you who have never done spectroscopy it involves taking a carbon electrode that is cupped at the top, you put the powder on that electrode and you bring the other electrode down above it and you strike an arc, in about 15 seconds the carbon at this high temperature burns away and the electrode's gone and your sample's gone, so all the laboratories in this country are doing 15 second burns and giving you the results. According to the Soviet Academy of Sciences the boiling temperature of water is to the boiling temperature of iron just like the boiling temperature of ferron is to the boiling temperature of these elements. As you know from driving a car as long as there is water in the motor of your car the temperature of that car engine will never hotter than the boiling temperature of water until all the water is gone. If you just heated the water on the stove in a pan you know that pan never gets hotter than the boiling temperature of the water till all the water is gone. Once all the water is gone the temperature skyrockets really fast. As long as there is iron there the temperature of the sample can never get hotter than the boiling temperature of the iron until all of the iron is gone so you can then heat this stuff. Now this is hard to fathom how something with as high a boiling temperature as iron could be just like water to these ailments but it is, so literally we had to design and build an excitation chamber where argon gas could be put around this electrode so then no oxygen or air could get into the carbon electrode and we could burn it not for 15 seconds but for 300 seconds, according to the Soviet Academy of Sciences this is the length of time we have to burn a sample. We set up, we got the PK blenders, we got the standards, we modified the machine, we did all the analysis for results, we did all the spectral lines on this three and a half meter instrument, that's the spec for how big the prism is which opens up the line spectrum, for those of you who don't know, most universities have a 1.5 meter instrument, this is a three and a half meter instrument, a huge machine, it took up the whole garage area, it was about 30 feet long and about 8 to 9 feet high. Anyway when we ran this material during the first 15 seconds we got iron, silica, aluminum, little traces of calcium, sodium maybe a little titanium no one then and then it goes quiet and nothing reads, so at the end of 15 seconds you are getting nothing, 20 seconds, 25 seconds, 30 seconds, 35 seconds, 40 seconds still got nothing, 45 seconds, 50 seconds, 55 seconds, 60 seconds, 65 seconds but if you look in through the colored glass sitting there on the carpet an electrode is this little ball of white material, there's still something in there. At 70 seconds, exactly when the Soviet Academy of Science said it would red, palladium begins to read, and after the palladium platinum begins to read, and after the platinum I think it was rhodium begins to read, after rhodium ruthenium begins to read. After ruthenium then iridium begins to read and after the iridium osmium begins to read. Now if you're like me, I didn't know what these elements were, I had heard of platinum, platinum jewelry, but what are these other elements, well there are E6 platinum group elements in the periodic table not just platinum, they didn't find out about them at the same time so they have been added one at a time, they are all elements just like iron, cobalt and nickel are three different elements, ruthenium, rhodium and palladium are light platinums and osmium, iridium and platinum are the heavy platinums. Well we came to find out that rhodium was selling for about $3,000 per ounce, gold sells for about $400 an ounce, iridium sells for about $800 an ounce and ruthenium sells for $150 an ounce. Then you say gee these are important materials aren't they, they are re-important materials because in the world the best known deposit is now being mined in South Africa, in this deposit you have to go a half mile into the ground and mine an 18 inch seam of this stuff, when you bring it out it contains one third of one ounce per ton of 
all the precious elements. Our analysis, which we ran for two and a half years and we checked over and over, we checked every spectral line, we checked every potential on interference, we checked every aspect of this, we created apples and apples, oranges and oranges, bananas and bananas, we wanted exact matches. When we were finished the man was able to do quantitative analysis and he sighed Ave, you have 6 to 8 ounces per ton of palladium, 12 to 13 ounces per ton of platinum, 150 ounces per ton of osmium, 250 ounces per ton of ruthenium, 600 ounces per ton of iridium, and 800 ounces per ton of rhodium, or a total of about 2,400 ounces per ton when the best known deposit in the world is one third of an ounce per ton. As you can see this work WASNT an indicator that these elements were there these elements were there and they were there in bow ups amounts they were saying hey stupid man pay attention we are trying to show you something. If they had been there in little amounts I probably would have contended with this but they were there in such huge amounts I said golly how can they be there in these quantities and no one knew it now you keep in mind it wasn't owned spectral analysis it was two and a half years of spectral analysis running this material every day and the man actually sent me away when they read Becker's he couldn't believe it either and he worked on it another two months before he called me up and apologized to me and he said Dave you are right that is how skeptical he was about it he couldn't apologize to me he is a German researcher with German pride so he had his wife call in apologized home. He was so impressed that he went back to Germany to the Institute of Spectroscopy. He was actually written up in the spectroscopic journals Ash having proven the existence of these elements in the southwestern United States in natural materials. It's not journals that you would ever read but I actually saw the journals. He was written up. They had no idea where this stuff was coming from, how we were producing it, what concentrations we had gone through or anything. They just had analyzed this small amount of powder. The crazy thing about it is, all we had done is remove the silica and sent the other stuff in. It was pretty unbelievable numbers. After we had come at this in every way we know how to disprove it. I decided all we have to do is throw money at this problem because money solves everything. Right so at 69 seconds I stopped the burn. I let the machine cool down and I took a pocket knife and dug that little bead out of the top of the electrode. When you shut off the arc it sort of absorbs down into the carbon and you have to dig down into the carbon to get it out this little bead of metal. So I sent this little bead of metal over to Harlow Laboratories in London. They made a precious metals analysis on this bead. I get the report back no precious element detected. Now this was one second before the palladium was supposed to start leaving. Yet according to neutron activation, which analyzes the nucleus itself, there were no precious elements detected. This made absolutely no sense at all. There had to be an explanation here. Either this material was converted to another element or it's in a form that we don't understand yet. So I decided that I just had to get more information and it, I went to a Ph.D. analytical chemist, a man who was trained at separating and purifying individual elements out of unknown material. He was trained at Iowa State University and he had a Ph.D. in metal separation systems. H.E. is the man that Motorola and Sperry used in the state of Arizona to handle their wastewater problems. He has worked with every element on the periodic table with the exception of ore. He has worked with all the rare earths. He has worked with all the man-made elements. He has physically separated everything on the periodic table with the exception of four elements. Coincidentally I came to him to have him separate six elements. Four of those were the elements he had never worked in. He said you know Mr. Hudson, I have heard this story before, all my life, and I'm a native Arizonan too. I have heard this story about these precious elements. I am very impressed with the way you have gone about this with a systematic way you have approached it. I cannot accept any money because if I accept money from you I have to write you a written report. All I have to sell is my reputation, all I have to sell is my credibility. I'm a certified expert witness in the state of Arizona in metallurgical separation systems. He said Dave I will work for you at no charge until I can show you where you are wrong. When I can tell you where you are wrong I'll give you a written report. Then you will pay me $60 an hour for the time I spent. This would have come to about $12 to $15,000. If this gets rid of the curse, if this just gets the thing answered once and for all, it's worth it. It was for me at the time. Do it. Get on with it. Well, three years later he said I can tell you it is not any of the other elements on the periodic table. We are educated. We are taught to do their chemical separation of the material and then send it for instrumental confirmation. 
The example I use is rhodium because it has a very unique color to the chloride solution. It is a cranberry color almost like the color of grape juice. There is no other element that produces the same color in chloride solution. When my rhodium was separated from all the other elements it produced that color of chloride. The last procedure you do to separate the material out is to neutralize the acid solution and it precipitates out of solution as a red-brown dioxide that is heated under a controlled atmosphere to 800 degrees for an hour and that creates the anhydrous dioxide, then you hydro reduce that under a controlled atmosphere to get the element and then you anneal away the excess hydrogen. So when we did that, we neutralized the acid solution and precipitated it out as a red-brown dioxide, which is the color it is supposed to precipitate. Then we filtered that out, we heated it under oxygen for an hour in a tube furnace then we hydro reduced it to this grey-white powder exactly the color rhodium should be as an element, then we heated it up to 1400 degrees under argon to anneal away the material and it turned snow white. Now this WASNT expected, this just ISNT what is supposed to happen, so what John did was he said Dave, I'm going to heat it to the anhydrous dioxide, I'm going to cool it down, I'm going to take one third of the sample and put it in a sealed vial, I'm going to put the rest of the sample back in the tube furnace and heat it up under oxygen, cool it back down, purge it with inert gas, heat it back up under hydrogen to reduce away the oxides and the hydrogen reacts with oxygen forming water and cleans the metal, it'll cool that down to the grey-white powder, it'll take half of that and put it in another sealed vial, it'll take the rest of the powder and put it back in the furnace, I'm going to oxidize it, and hydro reduce it and anneal it to the white powder, then I will put it into a vial and send all three vials to Pacific Spectrochem over in Los Angeles, one of the best spectroscopic firms in the US. The first analysis comes back, the red-brown dioxide is iron oxide, the next material comes back silica and aluminum, no iron present. Now just putting hydrogen on the iron oxide has made the iron quit being iron and now it has become silica and aluminum. Now this was a big sample, we just made the iron turn into silica and aluminum. The snow white annealed sample was analyzed as calcium and silica. Where did the aluminum go? John said Dave my life was so simple before I met you. He said this makes absolutely no sense at all. He said what you are working with is going to cause them to rewrite a physics books to rewrite chemistry books and come to a complete new understanding. John gave me his bill, it was $130,000 which I paid, but he said Dave, I have separated physically and I have checked it chemically 50 different ways and you have 4 to 6 ounces per ton of palladium, 12 to 14 ounces per ton of platinum, 150 ounces per ton of osmium, 250 ounces per ton of ruthenium, 600 ounces per ton of iridium, and 800 ounces per ton of osmium. The exact same numbers that the spectroscopist had told me were there, it was such an incredible number that John said Dave, I've got to go to the natural place where this stuff comes from and I've got to take my own samples, so he went up and actually walked the property and took his own samples, put it in a bag, brought them back to the laboratory, pulverized the entire sample and then started doing the analysis on what is called the master blend sample which represented the whole geology and he got the same numbers. We worked on this from 1983 until 1989, 1 pH. D. Chemist, three master chemists, two technicians working full-time, using the Soviet Academy of Sciences, the U.S. Bureau of Standards Weights and Measures Information as our starting point. We literally learned how to do qualitative and quantitative separations of all of these elements. We learned how to take commercial standards and make them disappear. We learned how to buy rhodium trichloride from Johnson. Matthew Inglehart is the metal and we learned how to break all the metal metal bonding until it literally was a red solution but no rhodium detectable, and it was nothing but pure rhodium from Johnson. Matthew Inglehart we learned how to do this with iridium, we learned how to do it with gold, we learned how to do it with osmium, we learned how to do it with ruthenium, and fart we found when we actually purchased a machine called high pressure liquid chromatography. And for your information this person named John Sikipos was the man who actually wrote his Ph. D. thesis at Iowa State University on how to build this instrument. He conceptualized building this instrument back in 196,364. After he graduated some of the graduate students there took that technology and developed it and eventually Dow Chemical came in and bought it. Dow went ahead and commercialized it. And now it is the most sophisticated chemical separation that the world has. It's computer controlled, all high pressure and you can do very precise separations with it, because this is the man who conceptualized, designed it, told them what the limitations would be. Eventually, on it he was the ideal man to take the technology and perfect it. 
so we were able to use their basic technology and develop a separation system for taking the rhodium trichloride. We actually separated five different species in the commercial rhodium trichloride. What this is all about is the word metal is like the word army. You can't have a one-man army. The word metal refers to a conglomerate material. It has certain properties, electrical conductivity, heat conduction and all these other aspects of it. When you dissolve the metals in acid you get a solution that is clear without solids. You assume it's a free ion but when you're dealing with Nobel elements it's still not a free ion. It's still what is called cluster chemistry. Back since the 1950s there has been a whole area of research in colleges called cluster chemistry catalytic materials. But what happens is the metal-metal bonds are still retained by the material. So if you buy rhodium trichloride from Johnson, Matthew and Engelhardt you are actually getting RH12 Cl36 or RH15 Cl45, you really aren't getting RH Cl3. There is a difference between the metal-metal bonding material and the free ions, and so how you are buying when you buy it is cluster chemistry you are not getting free ions. When you put it in for analytical instrumentation to analyze it, it is actually analyzing the metal-metal bonds of the cluster, it is not really analyzing the free ions. I heard that General Electric was building fuel cells using rhodium and iridium, so I made contacts with their fuel cell people back in Massachusetts and traveled back there to meet with them. They had three attorneys meet with us and the GE people were there. The attorneys were there to protect the GE people because a lot of people say they have technologies and they meet with them then after the meeting they sue them claiming that GE stole their technology. Then to defend themselves GE has to divulge what their technology really is, so GE is very skeptical when you say that you have something new. They bring in the highfalutin attorneys to really screen you. After about an hour they said these guys are for real, you attorneys can leave, because they had had the explosions also, they knew that when they buy the commercial rhodium trichloride that it analyzes very well, but to make it ready to go into their fuel cells they have to do effusions on it using salt effusions where they melt the salt and put the metal in with it to disperse it further, they know when they did it that the metal doesn't analyze as well anymore. So when we told them that we had material that didn't analyze at all they called conceive how this was possible, they had never seen it but they said we're interested, now these are the people who build analytical instrumentation, GE, they said Dave, why don't you just make a bunch of rhodium for us and send it to us and we'll mount it in our fuel cell technology, what is the mechanism of conversion of monatomic rhodium to metallic rhodium in these fuel cells, we'll see if it works in a place where only rhodium works, no other metal has ever been found which will perform the catalysis in the hydrogen evolving technology of the fuel cell other than rhodium and platinum, and rhodium is unique compared to platinum because rhodium does not poison with carbon monoxide and platinum does. They said Dave we will just run it to see if it's a hydrogen evolving catalyst and if it is then we will see if it is carbon monoxide stable and if it is then it's rhodium or it's a rhodium alternative. So we worked for about six months and refined that amount of material and we re-refined it and re-refined it. We wanted to be absolutely sure that this was really clean stuff. We didn't want any problems with this, we sent it back to Tony Leconte at GE. GE by that time had sold their fuel cell technology to United Technologies who already had a fuel cell technology, so all the GE fuel cell people had to go work for United Technologies and since United Technologies already had their in-house people the GE people were not integrated into the existing teams, so all the GE people were junior people, they weren't senior anymore, so after a certain period of months they all quit and left United Technologies, well Jose Gina, who was the head of fuel cells at United Technologies, quit it also on went to set up his own firm called Gina Incorporated in Waltham, Massachusetts. Tony and all the GE people went with him. By the time our material gets there they've their own company set up in Waltham, Massachusetts so we contract with them to build the fuel cells for us. When our material was sent to them the rhodium, as received, was analyzed to not have any rhodium in it, yet when they mounted it on carbon in their fuel gel technology and ran the fuel cell for several weeks it worked and it did fart only rhodium would do, and it was carbon monoxide stable. After three weeks they shut the fuel cells down and they take the electrodes out and send them back to the same place that said there was no rhodium in the original sample and now there is over 8% rhodium in the rhodium. What happens is, it begins to nucleate on the carbon, it actually begins to grow metal-metal bonds, so now there was metallic rhodium showing on the carbon where before there was no rhodium. So these GE people said Dave, if you are the first one to discover this, if you are the first one to explain how to make it in this form, if you are the first one to tell the world that it exists, then you can get a patent on this. 
I said I'm not interested in patenting this, then they told me that if someone else discovered it and patented it, even though I was using it every day, they could stop me from doing it. I said well, maybe I should patent it. So in March of 1988, we filed US and worldwide patents on orbitally rearranged monatomic elements. Now that is a mouthful, so to make it short we called it Orms. You have Ormi Gold, Orm Palladium, or Meridium, or Ruthenium, or Mosmium or Orms. When we were doing this patent procedure the patent office said Dave, we need more precise data, we need more exact data, we need more information about this conversion to this white powder state, so one of the problems we had is when you make this white powder and you bring it out into the atmosphere, the trilee starts gaining weight, I'm not talking about a little bit of weight. I'm talking about 2030%, this is not explained elsewhere, what does it mean now that normally would be called absorption of atmospheric gas as the air is reacting with it and causing weight gain but not 20 or 30%. But nonetheless we had to answer the patent office, we had to come up with exact data for the patent office, so what we did is use this machine called thermogravimetric analysis, this is a machine that has total atmospheric control of the sample, you can oxidize it, hydrogize it and anneal it while continually weighing the sample under a controlled atmosphere. Everything is all sealed, we were getting short on funding and couldn't afford to buy one so we leased one from the Bay Area from Berrien Corporation, they sent it in to us and we set it up on computer controls. We heated the material at 1.2 degrees per minute and cooled it at 2 degrees per minute. What we found is when you oxidize the material it weighs 102 percent, when you hydrogize it it weighs 103 percent. So far so good, no problem. But when it turns snow white it weighs 56 percent, now that's impossible. When you anneal it and it turns white it only weighs 56 percent of the beginning weight, if you put that on a silica test boat and you weigh it, it weighs 56 percent, if you heat it to the point that it fuses into the glass, it turns black and all the weight return, so the material hadn't volatized away, it was still there it just couldn't be weighed anymore, that's when everybody sighed this just isnt right it can't be. Do you know that when we heated it and cooled it and heated it and cooled it and heated it and cooled it under helium or argon that when we cooled it it would weigh 3 to 400 percent of its beginning weight and when we heated it it would actually weigh less than nothing. If it wasnt in the pan, the pan would weigh more than the pan weighs when this stuff is in it. Keep in mind these are highly trained people running this instrumentation and they would come in and say take a look at this, this makes no sense at all. Now this machine is so precisely designed and controlled that they actually have a magnetic material that you can actually put into this machine that is non-magnetic when it goes in the machine and at 300 degrees it becomes magnetic, it actually is a strong magnet, then after you get up to 900 degrees it loses its magnetism, and you can actually see if the interaction of the magnetism with the magnetic field of the heating element caused any change in weight. The heating element is bifilar wound, it goes round and round the sample thin you reverse it and wind it right back up so all the current runs against itself all the time. So when a wire flows electricity there is a magnetic field that forms around it but then you run the wire right next to it going in the other direction it forms a magnetic field in the other direction and the idea is that the two fields will cancel, now this is the kind of wiring that is used in a television to cancel all magnetic fields. The designers of this machine wanted to eliminate all magnetic field aspects though this, when we put the magnetic material in the sample and ran it with the magnetic material there was no response at all, there was no change in weight fun the material became magnetic or lost its magnetism, yet when our material is put in there and it turns white it goes to 56% of its beginning weight, if you shut the machine off and let it cool it is exactly 56%, if you heated it, it would go less than nothing and if you cooled it it would go 3 to 400% but it always goes back to a Steady 56%. Now we contacted Berean in the Bay Area and said look this just doesn't make any sense, there's something wrong with this machine I mean something isn't right, every time we use the machine it works fine unless we make their pure monatomic material and when we do it turns snow white and doesn't work correctly anymore, and Berean looked over our results and said you know MR. Hudson if you were working with the cooling of the material we would say it is superconducting, but in as much as you're heating the material we don't know what you've got. I decided well, I have had to learn chemistry and I have had to learn physics and now I've got to learn the physics of superconductors, so I borrowed a bunch of graduate books on superconductivity and I began to read about superconductors. 
One thing we did is we took our white powder. Now if this is a superconcator, I should be able to put this white powder down on the table and should be able to hook up a voltmeter here to it. You know your voltmeter has got two electrodes and you put it on a wire and turn on the battery pack and it tells you the resistance in the wire. Well if you touch the powder with one electrode on one end and the other on the other end and turn on the electricity you just figure the needle is going to go boing, just like this, right perfect conductivity, right nothing, zilch, nothing no conductivity at all, so we think what's going on here so what we found out is that the definition of a superconductor is that it does not allow any voltage potential or any magnetic field to exist inside the sample, so by definition a superconductor will not allow any voltage potential to exist inside the sample, to get electricity electricity off of a wire requires voltage and to get electricity back on the wire requires a voltage. So it cannot receive electricity from a wire, it cannot receive the energy off the superconductor back on the wire without voltage. Part 2 So now I know your question is so what the heck good is this stuff if you can get energy into it and you can't get energy back out of it, what the heck good is it? Well what you come to find out is that in the superconductor there is a single frequency of light, just like a laser, that is flowing perpetually inside the superconductor, and when it flows inside the superconductor it produces around it what is called a Meissner field which is unique to superconductors. A Meissner field excludes all external magnetic fields from the sample. What color must it be? It has to be white. Anything that excludes all light from the sample has to be white. Anything that absorbs all light has to be black. How does this statement square with a flash in the pan from exposure to sunlight if it reflects all light? It has to be white now. I'm talking about a pure single element superconductor. It has to be white when it is superconducting. Check this out. What you have to do is you have to take a radio frequency transmitter and you have a to resonance frequency tune the superconductor to match the frequency of the wire. More likely tune the wire to match the superconductor. So the wire now is oscillation with its electron waves exactly the same as the superconductor. At that point the electronic pair can go on the superconductor with no push at all, because electrons are continually moving over here on the wire and they are seeking the path of least resistance, and so when you have them in perfect synchronization with the superconductor they go on with no push at all as pairs. Now this takes a little explaining because one spin one half electron plus one spin one half electron are two particles, yet when these two particles become perfectly paired as mirror images of each other they lose all particle aspects and they became nothing but pure light. This doesn't make sense either, does it? But that's the way it is. Spin one half plus spin one half gives you spin one which now is pure light. Trust me it is so, so they can go on as individual electrons, they go on as light. Now the crazy thing about electrons is that one electron can exist in one space-time and if it moves to another space-time it gives off light or absorbs light, it's moving from one space-time to another. Now we have light, which is two electrons. Light doesn't exist in any space-time. You can put 50 billion lights all in the same space-time and it is okay. Now we don't have a conductor, a conductor you put electricity on the wire, you got to take the electricity off or it won't flow, you've got to ground it, right with a superconductor it's not, it can go on and go on and go on and go on, dot and it doesn't have to come off, now if you want to take it off you have to put a wire next to it and you have to resonance frequency tune the wire to match the superconductor, and when it's in perfect harmony you apply a voltage and puff off goes the energy. So if you literally can make a superconductor that stretches from Portland to New York City and you put energy on over here for two or three or four days, you don't have to take it off over there. It's okay you can keep putting it in. And when they want it in New York they can resonance frequency tune the wire, apply voltage and suck it out. It gets a free ride from Portland all the way to New York, on this quantal wave of the superconductor, as light note electricity. How do you measure it if it has no voltage in it? How is it possible to get a machine that can measure this light? And guess what? It can't be done, cause every piece of instrumentation man has ever figured out always uses a differential it must reflect and yet a superconductor has no voltage. You literally start the superconductor flowing by applying a magnetic field. It responds to the magnetic field by flowing light inside of it and building a bigger Meissner field around it. You can put your magnet down and walk away, you come back a hundred years later and it is still flowing exactly the same as when you left, it doesn't ever slow down, it excludes, not 99.9999, it excludes 100.000000 of all external magnetic fields, there is absolutely no resistance in the sample, it is perpetual motion, it runs forever and ever and ever and ever. 
The Russian physicist Sakharov said in the 1960s that we are looking for gravity and we are never going to find it as a magnetic field. Gravity is far as produced when protons, neutrons and electrons interact with the vacuum energy, that energy that is everywhere in the universe, timeless. That energy that is there like the ether, when you pump out all heat and all matter everything, there still is energy there, it's called the vacuum energy, when the protons, neutrons and electrons interact with that energy they produce gravity, if there is no matter, there is no gravity. Interesting theory. Everyone kind of ignored it for a while, then this fellow by the name of Hal Puthoff down in Texas who began life over here in the Bay Area in California doing distant viewing experimentation, now HES working down in Austin, Texas. H.E. Puthoff works at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin and Austin, Texas, and he actually developed the mathematics for Sakharov's theory of gravity. He published this in 1993 in one of the top science journals. It was actually published in the March 1, 1989 issue of Physical Review A. The paper is titled Gravity as a Zero-Point Fluctuation Force B.Y.H. E. Puthoff. In the mathematics he actually does all his mathematical calculations it figures out that when matter begins to react in two dimensions, as opposed to interacting in three dimensions, which by definition a superconducator is a resonance coupled quantum oscillator resonating in two dimensions, not three dimensions he comes up with a mathematics which shows when it begins to interact in two dimensions that it should theoretically lose four ninths of its gravitational weight, did you know that five ninths is 56%, exactly? So I decided that I've got to go down and see Hal Pudloff, I've got to take all my data and go down and see Hal Pudloff, I said Hal, we have their experimental confirmation that, in fact, your mathematics are absolutely correct, in addition Sakharov's theory of gravity is absolutely correct. Because this material only weighs 56% when it goes to the superconducting state, and Hal Puthoff says Dave, you do realize that gravity is what determines spacetime, and he said Dave, when this material only weighs 56% of its true mass you do realize that this material is actually bending spacetime, now if you think about this it seems correct, he said Dave, what we really need is a material that totally bends spacetime, a material that has no gravitational attraction at all, less than zero, it's what he called exotic matter in his papers. I said Hal, do you realize that if you heat this material it has no gravitational attraction at all I've been reading papers on the vacuum energy, do you know that there is an overlap between the thermal spectrum and the zero point spectrum the two of them overlap, and so if you heat something it should interact with the zero point energy, well this material because it was resonating in two dimensions, when you heat it it literally loses all gravitational attraction. You know what Hal Puthoff said to me, he said Dave at that point you shouldn't be able to see the material, I said correct, you can look in the pan, through the quartz tube and there is nothing in the pan, but the pan isn't weighing what it would weigh if the stuff wasnt in it. Now I had mistakenly assumed that the material was just resonating at a frequency we didnt perceive, he said Dave, theoretically it should be withdrawing from these three dimensions, it should not even be in these three dimensions, I said wow. He said Dave, you have to devise an experiment where you can do this while light is not there, pass an arm through the sample pan, so if it is there and resonating at a frequency that you don't perceive you knock it out of the pan, because when you cool it back down and it begins to reappear it always appears in the same shape it was in before it left, and he says if it's there you're going to knock it out of the pan, then when you cool it down, it's going to return back in exactly the place it was before, that's proof that it left these three dimensions, and he said Dave, if you do that you will never ever want for money, do you think a stealth plane is really important? What happens when it can literally disappear now? What are some of the other aspects of a superconducator you see in 1988? I not only filed a patent on ORMS, I filed a patent on SORMES, the resonant coupled quantum oscillating system of many atoms of these ORMS. I have 11 patents on ORMS and another 11 patents on SORMES. I have 22 patents. What are some of the other aspects of a superconductor? A superconductor, how do you prove it's a superconductor? You literally take a constant magnetic field and you pass the material into the constant magnetic field. If it's not a superconducator, if you apply a magnetic field, you get positive inductance. If you graph it, applied magnetic field versus inductance, magnetic field versus inductance. DH waves hands depicting a graph if it's a perfect insulator, you'll run totally parallel, no matter how much magnetic field you apply, no inductance, if it's a perfect conductor, just the littlest amount of magnetic field on a perfect conductor will go straight up, so between here and Harrison Place, most metals graph about like this. 
If it's a superconductor as you apply a magnetic field it goes negative, it literally eats the magnetic field, it feeds on the magnetic field and takes it inside itself. Negative inductance in a positive applied magnetic field is the proof of a superconductor. In other words if you had a machine that was a superconductor when it passed by ordinary power lines, it would cancel the voltage potential of the power lines, or if it passed by a home that had electric appliances it would literally turn them off and cause them to flicker and go off. Do you realize that if you had a machine that would do that, it could literally move in space-time is what Hal was saying that it could disappear and reappear in space-time, it could withdraw from these three dimensions into a fifth dimension where there is no distance, and there is no time between here and other star systems and then reappear out of that in that star system. Have you ever heard of anything that does that anyway? The material is very very important, the material and the way it works is very very important, because we are talking about controlling gravity and we are talking about controlling space-time. Now let me give you an analogy, if, if it is possible for me to shrink your molecular body down small enough, miniaturization that would make you so tiny that, you could climb inside of an atom, you'd be down in the world of the quanta where there is no time forward and there is no time reverse everything is interchangeable, there is no time as we know it, you would become an immortal, you literally could live forever in the world of the quanta. A superconductor is billions and billions and billions of atoms all acting like one big macro atom, and so literally you make yourself a vessel that you can climb inside of that superconducts and you energize it and you exclude all external magnetic fields including gravity, and you are now in this world, but you are not of this world, hear me, in this world but not of this world. And literally by just heating it you can literally disappear from this space-time, just like that, gone. Now you will still be able to see everybody there, they just can't see you anymore. It's like being above the water and looking down in the water at the fish, you're not in their world, but you can see them. Someone from the audience interrupts with a question, but you wouldn't have any thoughts either because they produce electromagnetic fields. Big silence from Dave Hudson. Then person from audience says you would just have pure awareness. Dave Hudson recovers by saying that is correct, as you can see this becomes very philosophical very quickly, when you come to understand as we did that literally we decided well gee if we had this analytical capability, and we can quantitatively and qualitatively analyze this stuff where else is it so we went down to AJ Bayless and got ourselves some cow's brains and some pig's brains, we carburized these brains in fuming sulfuric acid, that was a really raunchy thing to do but it was the only way we knew to do it, we weren't organic chemists, we were inorganic chemists so we we destroyed the carbon, carburized it, added nitrice nitrice nitric acid, kept taking it down to fumes of sulfuric more nitric, fumes of sulfuric more nitric till we got rid of all the carbon, then water, water, water till we got rid of all the nitrous compounds, then we did a metal sulfate analysis, did you know that of a 5% by dry matter weight of the brain tissue is rhodium and iridium in the high spin state, did you know that the way cells communicate with each other is by superconductivity that the US Naval Research Facility knows that the weight communicate with each other is by superconductivity that they have actually measured it using squid superconducting quantum interference devices with a superconducting ring around the body, and they have seen by this procedure that literally light flowed between cell to cell to cell to cell, did you know that your nerve impulses are not electricity that they travel closer to the speed of sound and neither to the speed of light and electricity travels closer to the speed of light, do you know what speed the superconducting wave travels the speed of sound, this, in fact, is what is in your body that we we call the consciousness, it's what separates you from a computer. It literally is the light of life, this is that part of your body that has been there all of this time, that scientists can't find because their instruments can't see it, they call it carbon because it has no absorption or emission spectra and they assume therefore that it is carbon when, in fact, it isn't carbon, that there are 11 elements that it could be but primarily rhodium and iridium are the elements that are in your body right now, and that literally they resonance connect and literally flow the light of life perpetually in your body, and around your body you have a non-polar magnetic field field which is called the Meissner field, they refer to it as the aura. That literally, these are the spirit atoms in your body, these are the atoms that are in resonant harmony and resonating with the vacuum energy, and the vacuum energy is another dimension where there is no time. Everything that ever existed and everything that ever will exist is registered in the vacuum. And I will tell you now, my friends, that when you meet your God, you will meet him in the vacuum, that is where all matter came from, that is where all matter originated and that is where everything is recorded, and your connection is through these resonant oscillators that are in quantum resonance here with the vacuum energy, that is what brings the light of life from the world off the quanta up into the macro body you call your own physical being. 
These atoms, in a macro state and dried, look like a white powder, but actually if you look at them under a microscope they look like glass, you can actually heat the white powder to 1160 degrees under a vacuum and it forms a glass just like that window glass, another form the element can exist in. When you come to understand that each of these atoms is resonating with the vacuum energy, you can't harness a single atom, you can't put reins on a tan say work for me this perpetual motion machine, but when one atom is resonating back and forth in two dimensions it creates a quantile wave that comes off of it, the next atom nestles in that wave and perpetuates the wave. The atoms are actually too far apart to have any chemistry and yet they are sitting at a distance resonating in perfect unison, harmony, the energy that literally rolls around one atom forever and ever and ever. Did you ever ask yourself why an atom never runs down? It is because it is dipping into the zero point energy all of the time, but now you have each atom in resonant harmony with each other, each atom dipping into the zero point energy, so now you've got billions and billions and billions of them doing it for you. So what you now have is a perpetual motion machine, you have something that literally is running perpetually on zero-point energy, you actually can build a ring of this material and it will flow and respond to the Earth's magnetic field. For example, did you know that a single element superconductor, a type 1 superconductor, will literally respond to a magnetic field of 2 times 10 to the minus 15th ergs and do you know that there is 10 to the 18th power ergs in a Gauss and the Earth's magnetic field that the compass aligns with is about 0.5 Gauss so an erg is the measure of the magnetic field around only electron. And a superconductor responds to a magnetic field of 2 times 10 to the minus 15 ergs gosh, literally, when you think it registers, so when you are working with this material your thoughts are registering in the material. In fact, some of you women will get upset with me when I say this but we actually came to know these as female elements, cause what we did is we sighed you know we're going to flip these things, we're just going to overcome these things, cause if you just put enough energy to them you can make them do what you want, right sure, we purchased what is called an arc furnace. We took about 30 grams of this white powder and we put it in the furnace. This furnace had an insulated crucible, it had a copper crucible in it, with water all around it to keep it cool, you bring a lid to set down on top of it and there's a tungsten rod that hangs down in it, and it actually runs a little arc welder which you strike from the tungsten electrode to the copper. And in this arc you sit there and you stir with the electrode back and forth, back and forth, till you literally melt everything that is there. Now what WEDID was we pumped out all of the air, we backfilled it with helium gas, for a plasma gas, and we struck the arc, it went BZZP, like that and shut off, we opened up the arc furnace, no tungsten electrode, now this tungsten electrode ice about the size of my thumb, tungsten is the filament material that they make light bulbs out of, the people who built this furnace said we could use it for 35 to 40 times with no deterioration of the electrode, we're cold burn it for minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes, we did and avenger to second out of this thing, so we sent to the manufacturer, got another electrode, put it back in it, put back on, closed it back up, vacuumed the air out, put in the inert gas, struck another arc, BZZP, shut off, opened it up again and the tungsten electrode is all molten into this powder. What we found when we analyzed the powder after we did this, it wasnt thesame element it was before we did this, and what we also found is that there is an amplification of heat about 2000 times, it was not chemical heat, it was nuclear heat, what we found is all the wiring in the laboratory is beginning to crumble and fall apart, you could go up to copper wires and oh that and they would just go to powder. The glass beaker sitting in the laboratory near the furnace was getting full off, little air pockets in the glass and when we would pick them up they would fall apart, and that's radiation damage, there is no other explanation for it, it'll show you tomorrow that Berkeley Brookhaven has confirmed that this is 25,000 electron volt photons, I don't remember being shown this gamma level radiation comes out of these high spin atoms when you throw too much energy at them, so like all females if you tell them you will force them you will get absolutely nothing, but if you give them what they want, they will give you what you want, so you cater to these elements you don't fight these ailments, these elements are alive, and what you have to do is give them their chemistries that they want, cooperate with them, coerce them, give them what they want and they will literally go back to the low spin state and you can make them into metals, or you can use them in the high spin state. 
Now everything was pretty interesting now till my uncle came up with this book in 1991 called Secrets of the Alchemists. I said I'm not interested in reading about alchemy, this is when the church was involved in it and everything. This was all perverted, I'm not interested in that. I want to know about chemistry and physics. He said Dave, it talks about a white powder off gold. I said really and so I began to look into alchemy and the philosopher's stone. The container of the light of life was the white powder off gold. Now I said is there a chance that this white powder of gold that I have could it be the white powder of gold they're talking about or is it possible that there is two white powders of gold now the description says it is the container of the essence of life it flows the light of life well that we had proven it's a superconductor it flows the light that is in your body they claimed that it perfects the cells of the body well I can show you tomorrow Bristol Myers Squibb research that shows that this material interacts with DNA, correcting the DNA, all the carcinogenic damage, all the radiation damage, all is corrected from these elements in the presence of the cell, they don't chemically interact with it, they just correct the DNA. I really became intrigued with this stuff, what would happen if we give this material to people it's not metal metal bonding so it doesn't have heavy metal properties, so first of all we got a golden retriever and gave the material to the golden retriever, this golden retriever had tick fever, valley fever and a large abscess here on his side, and none of the veterinarians could find any medicine that would get rid of it due to the combination of all three diseases, and they just gave up to they weren't going to cure him, we began giving him 1 cc injections of 1 milligram of the white powder, one shot in the tumor in one shot in the bloodstream. After a week and a half the tick fever was gone, the valley fever was gone, the tumor has shrunk down and disappeared, so we stopped the injections. About a week later it starts coming back again, so we start giving the injections again and it shrunk back down again. This time we continued about a week longer and then when we stopped it never came back. The dog felt great. So then the doctor we were working with said you know this is really incredible stuff. He said you know I have an assistant that works in my doctor's office who is a day or two away from death with AIDS. He is being fed intravenously right now. He can't speak. He can't dress himself. He is dying. So he said I'm going to start giving him just a little bit of this material and see what happens. A week and a half later he had pulled out all the feed lines out of his arms. He was feeding himself normally, getting dressed on his own, just doing great. A month and a half later he was on an airplane going back to a family wedding in Indiana and nobody even knows he has AIDS. This doctor says Dave, this is like a magic material, so he got a patient who had KS Carpazi sarcoma which is the cancer you get all over your skin. This man had over 30 lesions all over his body and we began to give her own milliliter injections into his bloodstream. After a month and a half there was no more active KS on his body. One milligram per day now if you are a familiar with KS there is only one treatment and that is radiation treatment. And after a while you get the maximum amount of radiation and they have to discontinue the treatment. Then you get worse and die. And this totally got rid of KS lesions. Then we started working with another patient who was actually not gay. This woman had received the AIDS virus in an in vitro fertilization that was done down at the University of Arizona. There were 10 women who received these men from this patient who had the HIV virus. She was the only one who got AIDS. She had it for 11 years. She was really starting to go downhill. Her white blood cell count and her T cell count were really classic. We gave it to her orally for the first time and basically there was no change in her white blood cells and her T cells. Now when we give it by injection the white blood cell count goes from 2200 to 6500 in an hour and a half. Unbelievable. When we take it orally nothing happens to the white blood cell count, which is the only analytical battle we have available. After a month she said I want the injection I want to see this increase my white blood cell count. So we prepared her a shot and she took the material by injection. At the same time we gave her the shot, we pulled blood samples and sent them to knowing laboratories in Southern California for an infected viands per milliliter F blood analysis, she took the first inject ions. She got high fevers, just like everyone does, so we said cut it in half, she cut it in half. Actually the doctor cut it in half the next day she took a tan she went into seizures and she died. I just found out from a man in San Francisco that people who have taken AZT that AZT can cause brain lesions and Hodgkin's lymphomas in the brain. Anything that dramatically stimulates the immune system can cause them to go into seizures, and so we don't take someone with AZT and give them the injections. 
By the time we got our analysis back from knowing laboratories and its either infected virin count was so low that this woman should NT even though she had AIDS. Now we did NT do an analysis up front so we decided well well start giving this to people after we do a lab analysis. We worked with a man who had an infected virin count of 57,000. He was so weak that he could only walk. He used a cane. The doctor said he gave him two to three weeks to live. He took this material orally and it took about 60 days to begin to drop the infected virin count. After 60 days it went down 30% every 30 days. By the end of 7 months it was so low they couldn't even detect it anymore in his blood. And that's taking 50 milligrams per day orally. Now do understand, I'm not a doctor, I have no interest in becoming a doctor. What I wanted to know is, is it possible that this stuff works that is all the interest was. There was one doctor in North Phoenix that I gave two bottles of the dried material to and he gave it to two cancer patients. Only was 42 years old and the other was 57 years old. They both had breast cancer. The 42-year-old woman had had her breast removed two years earlier and had extensive radiation treatments. After two years show as having pain in her neck, pain in her ribs. She went to a chiropractor that couldn't help her. She finally ended up with an oncologist who said she had cancer in her neck, her shoulder, her back, her spine, and your ribs. He sighed at his stage 4, get your affairs in order, we can give you chemotherapy but you are going to die. The woman went to this doctor, he gave her these capsules which was a month and a half worth of pills. She took this material, at 100 milligrams, for a month and a half. At the end of the month and a half she went back to the oncologist. She had no cancer anywhere in her body. I didn't even know who the woman was. I had nothing to do with giving her the material. I get this phone call and this woman says Mr. Hudson, I don't know who you are or what this material is, but it is really fantastic material. And she told Med story. The 57-year-old woman it apparently didn't work on, we were then back at the University of Chicago having cancer studies done with mice, and what we found is about half the mice it killed of cancers but the other half the cancers grew faster, but at the end of the study the cancer researchers injected the mice with estrogen, which should have caused the cancers to then grow faster, instead as soon as the estrone hit their bodies within 24 hours all the cancers were gone, and so what I suggest to people right now is anyone who is over 40 years of age, Age I understand should consider taking DHEA or some female hormone because in treating breast cancer the female hormone plays an important role in the treatment of the breast cancer. Now I'm not presenting this to you as technical information, I'm presenting this to you as my experience and what I can tell you about it. We also had a doctor in Florida who was giving it to a pancreatic cancer patient. Last November, he was dramatically losing weight, he did not expect him to survive, so they were desperate for anything. He took this for 60 days and has now gained all his weight back and is doing just great today. The doctor doesn't understand it, he is just totally blown away about how it could happen because nobody survives pancreatic cancer. This is not an anti-anything, this is not anti-AIDS, this is not anti-cancer, this is pro-life, it literally is the spirit, the material is not there to cure AIDS, the material is not here to cure cancer, the material is here to perfect our bodies, it makes our bodies be in the state they are supposed to be in, it is our own immune system that fights and cures the disease, if you can correct your DNA at every cell in your body, if you can correct the damage that's been done that brought about the cancer, if you can correct the damage that has been brought about by the virus, the you literally will become a perfected being, you will return back to the original healthy state you were meant to be in. This is not a medicine, this material is, in fact, a philosophical material. It is here to enlighten and to raise the consciousness of mankind, if in doing that it happens to cure diseases so be it, it's real hard for most of us to understand that this is what it is all about. We are just about at 9 o'clock, tomorrow I will lay out all the physics that has happened since I filed my patent, I will lay out all the theories about superconductivity and the high spin atoms, we will come to see all the published literature, I will put it up on the overhead projector where you can read the credentials, Brookhaven National Laboratories, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, the Niels Bohr Institute over in Copenhagen, you will see all the papers on superconductivity in the body, you will see all the papers on literally the light of life being the superconductor. 
data, and we will discuss in depth the zero-point energy, the vacuum energy, space-time, gravity, and he will explain it to you, I think, clearly, and all of you will walk out of here with a pretty good understanding of what gravity and space-time reality is, and how we adjust a hologram a picture show, ourselves, we are no reality even ourselves, then we will go into the history of this from 4 or 5000 BC to the Tigris-Euphrates valleys, Zachariah Sitchin papers, to the Egyptian pharaohs and high priests, to the Hebrews and the Bible, to the prophecies of Nostradamus, the keys of Enoch, all the prophecies relating to this material, and the prophecy that it will be here by 1999 will be known to science, so that is the story. We will see you tomorrow if you feel like coming. End of transcript source http www.eskimo.com tilde bilbfreenrudson.txt subject related links.